and folks are filtering in now. At about 101, I'll get started. Okay, I'm gonna get started. I know folks are still filtering in, um, but there's a script available for this part of the talk. So I think we'll be okay if folks have to catch up. I have some open, opening marks to share, but I'll keep them brief so that we can honor your time. My name is Dr. Karen Morosky rigney and I am one of the two associate directors of the Writing Center at Michigan State University. I just wanted to take a few minutes to welcome you all to the second event in our speaker series, Writing Centers and Access. I'd like to direct your attention to the email where you received your Zoom link to join us today. In that email, there's information on how to navigate our webinar space. I hope you'll find it helpful. I'd also like to note that today's talk will be recorded so we can share the event asynchronously via our YouTube channel and our Writing Center's website. And lastly, after our time together ends, we will reach out to you one more time via email with the response survey regarding today's event. I'd like to thank the Cal Engaged Pedagogy and Programming Event Fund for making this event possible. I'd like to thank our grant co-authors at the Center for Language and Teaching. And I'm especially grateful to the Citizen Scholars Program for their incredibly generous funding, which enabled us to ensure ASL translation services and CART captioning. I'm also grateful to the administrative team of the Writing Center here at Michigan State University, Dr. Trixie Long-Smith, Dr. Grace Pregent, Colton Wansittler, Monica Shelberg, and Amanda Broman. Lastly, I want to thank the members of our Writing Center's Accessibility Committee who have worked tirelessly to put on these events for you and for me and for all of us. I gave more extended opening remarks at the first event of this series. And if you'd like to view them, the link to that script is in your information email as well. For now, in the interest of your time, I'd like to turn things over to EJ Harris, a graduate student on our Accessibility Committee who's going to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Margaret Price. The floor is yours, EJ. Thanks, Karen. And hi, everyone. I'm EJ. I'm so glad you're all joining us for this series. We have a wonderful group of speakers to learn with, and I'm honored to have this opportunity today to introduce you all to Dr. Margaret Price. Margaret Price is Associate Professor and Director of Disability Studies at The Ohio State University where she also serves as co-founder and lead PI on the Transformative Access Project. Her book, Mad at School, Rhetorics of Mental Disability and Academic Life, won the Outstanding Book Award for, for the college Conference on College Composition and Communication. Other writing of hers appears in Inside Higher Ed, Disability Studies Quarterly, Ms. Magazine, and Kairos, a journal of rhetoric, technology, and pedagogy. In 2017, Margaret was inducted into the Susan M. Daniels Disability Mentoring Hall of Fame, and in 2020, she was awarded a Fulbright grant to study access and design at the University of Gothenburg, Sweden. Margaret's current research project is a survey and interview study of disabled higher education faculty. She's at work on a book titled Crip Space Time, under contract with Duke University Press. I was first exposed to Margaret Price's work through her ideas about the spaces we interact, exchange power, and produce knowledge in, about our bodies and minds being inextricably linked, and about the way disability appears, is made invisible, and is understood in higher education. Price doesn't just write about access and disability, she enacts what she advocates for. In Mad at School, for example, she says of the term psychosocial, quote, having spent the last couple years trying this term out, on the page, in conference presentations, at dinner with friends, I've become increasingly uncomfortable with it because in most cases, it seems to provoke puzzlement rather than connection." End quote. This to me speaks to her commitment to sharing knowledge in a way that doesn't assume, that addresses the power dynamics present in our interactions, that is personal and beautifully readable. 
In conversations of her work on chirotic spaces, our Accessibility and Writing Center's class was able to think more critically about the interactions in our Writing Center and in our lives as students that have power differentials we might perceive differently from our perspective than the people we're interacting with. It made clear to me that just because we see our Writing Center as a friendly, comfortable space, that doesn't mean everyone else does, and we have a ways to go before it could feel that way for everyone. And since reading Matt at school, I find myself asking often, why aren't we including teachers in this conversation, consultants? Who else has shared stakes in how we're talking about interaction and access? And how can we include them as essential parts of this conversation and work too? I want to thank you, Dr. Price, for being with us today and for encouraging me through the example of the phenomenal work you do. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Margaret Price for Everyday Survival and Collective Action, what we can learn from disabled faculty about access and care. Hi everyone. Oh my goodness. I've just put a cover slide on the screen and I'm presently experiencing that weird feeling of being unsure whether over a hundred people hear me right now or no one. Uh, happily, I have given Karen my cell number. Karen, please text me if anything weird is happening. The cover slide gives the title of this talk, Everyday Survival and Collective Action. What we can learn from disabled faculty about access and care. The image is a graphic that I clipped from the Arkansas Times. It's a comic showing about 50 people standing in a long winding line. At the head of the line is a person labeled healthcare worker. Near the end of the line are people labeled prisoners and young adults. And right in the middle is a red silhouette labeled you. I'll return to this graphic in a few minutes. I am truly honored to be part of this series. I don't think I've ever been part of a series quite like this one, not just because it focuses on writing centers and access. I think that's, that's a pretty first of its kind uh, topic for a series, but also because it's thinking about the people in the series as kind of dimensional, um, not just one person to sort of comes in with a bang and then leaves, but an ongoing series of conversations and supported conversations, funded conversations. Um, I'm, I'm truly honored to be part of this event and it is truly unusual in its infrastructure. It also includes some of my absolute favorite disability studies colleagues and friends, people I respect tremendously and who have pushed my own thinking into places it would never have gone otherwise. I'm also grateful to Karen Morosky, M-O-R-O-S-K-I for her encouragement, generosity, and good cheer in putting this event on. Thank you. During this event, please do whatever you'd like to do that helps make it more accessible for you. Move around, turn your camera off as you might need to, stim, fidget, and so on. You may observe me standing up and sitting down while I'm speaking or occasionally pausing to see where the captionist or interpreters are or briefly interacting with my dogs who are here in the room with me. <laughs> I'm actually tilting my screen right now. It's very sunny in my study, so it's not a great view of my dogs, but there's a very small brown chihuahua curled up in front of a fuzzy blue bed and a black lab mix curled up in a gray bed. Hey guys, hi. They both looked up, but I'm, I'm not sure they're especially easy to see right now. I am a white gender queer person with gray hair and glasses. There's a shelf of green plants and a large red amaryllis off to my left. And behind me are white bookcases. I am extremely sorry to report that I am not wearing a tiara. Uh, <laughs> there was some chat on Twitter about how I wanted to wear a tiara for this talk. Um, I don't totally remember why, except I just love tiaras and I, I thought I had one. Um, I appear to have uh, given the tiara away in a fit of pandemic organizing. 
Um, so I wanted to uh, show you a few of the other glittery queer femme things that I have with me and around me to help me feel brave enough to talk with you. Um, one is my gold blind red sloth who sits right beside me while I'm giving talks. And um, another is my uh, dragonfly paperweight, um, which my partner gave me, and which I always use on my desk. And um, yet another are my earrings. I'm wearing little pearl earrings and I hardly ever wear earrings. So <laughs> those who are wearing tiaras in solidarity, thank you. Now there's one more thing I want to frame about uh, who I am and where I'm standing. As a faculty member at Ohio State, I am occupying the ancestral and contemporary territory of the Shawnee, Potawatomi, Delaware, Miami, Peoria, Seneca, Wyandotte, Ojibwe, and Cherokee peoples. I want to recognize those ancestral ties, but I also want to recognize the ongoing work of the tribal nations who are connected to the land that I'm standing on right now. This includes the work of Dr. Christine Ballingy Morris, who is currently director of Ohio State's American Indian Studies Program, and Dr. Melissa Beard Jacob, who is an American and indigenous intercultural specialist at OSU's Multicultural Center. Both Melissa and Christine have taught me that acknowledging land occupation does not just mean recognizing and being accountable for history. It also means continuing to work in solidarity in the present. The angle that I hope to offer today on the theme of writing and access is to focus on that term itself, access, and think through what we mean by it. We might mean the ability to obtain some resource or the ability to use that resource effectively once it's obtained. These are forms of access that Adam Banks identified as material and functional. We could also think of access as a kind of precarious way of being a sense of having made it through the back door, which is probably next to some dumpsters, but always being, as Tanya Tichkowski says, barely in. And we might mean something that has nothing to do with an easily nameable disability at all, a sense of being recognized and valued, held, our needs met not only as they are anticipated, but also as they come along and change through the context of a situation. That's a form of access that Mia Mingus calls access intimacy. Going back to the dimensions of access offered by Adam Banks, we can also think of access as sometimes being transformational, something that is practiced in communities to effect change. These are all elements of access that I draw upon when I talk today about what it means to practice access with accountability. Speaking of access, <laughs> Uh, I do want to mention to the interpreter that the names I'm saying are on the slide. Um, I have a different view from uh, participants, so I, I'm not able to follow the interpreter right now. So um, I'm gonna ask Karen uh, if there is, that's not what I was trying to do. <laughs> My phone literally just rang. Uh, Karen, if there's any problem with uh, names, uh, please let me know. I can always slow down and spell them out. Um, oh, and by let me know, I mean text me. Will do. Thank you. So Jay Dolmage's talk a couple of weeks ago, um, I was able to catch some of it. Awesome. Love Jay. Uh, he offered a great discussion of the concept of the retrofit and why accommodations are often problematic. Now, if you didn't catch his talk, I'll quickly summarize the point of the retrofit. When we use accommodations as fixes for people who are imagined to either have problems or be problems, we are always retrofitting. In other words, we are approaching something that already exists in an established system or design, and we're trying to rejigger it in one place for one person. That has a number of unwanted effects. First, of course, the attempted fix often doesn't work very well because it's not part of the system as a whole. 
in effect, it's a patch. Second, and probably more devastating for the people who experience this, it identifies the person as the problem instead of identifying the inaccessible system as the problem. So today I want to build on Jay's wonderful research to talk about moving beyond an academic world where we're always turning to individual accommodations and toward a world that achieves access through values like shared accountability and mutual care. This is a move, looking back at the slide, that Amy Hamrayi and others call critical access. Critical access draws upon some principles of universal design, but it emphasizes questions of power relations, histories, structures, and accountability. So as I promised, we're now returning to the graphic on the cover slide. This graphic was used to illustrate a report on a tool that was released by the New York Times on December 3rd, 2020. The New York Times piece was headlined, find your place in the vaccine line. And it also showed a graphic of people in line, although in that case, only five people, one of whom is wearing a large puffer coat. It's fill in the blank tool was designed to calculate, quote, where you might fit in that line, end quote. Now, the author of this tool, whose name is Stuart A. Thompson, as well as his editors seem to have missed the fact that that's not actually how vaccines work. Escaping the devastation of COVID-19 is about epidemiology. It's about groups. It's not about individual immunity. But even if you did believe that, even if you thought the vaccine was a kind of cloak of invisibility protecting you from all forms of COVID-19 forever, side note, it's not, there's actually a bigger problem with this rhetoric, the rhetoric of the line. It creates an unmistakable sense that we are in competition with each other. Kenneth Burke, B-U-R-K-E, might call this a terministic screen. Now, over the next several days, after this article in the Times came out, dozens of my friends posted on social media about having tried out the tool and what their own places in line were. I suspect that the journalists and illustrators creating this terministic screen would say that they're actually trying to critique the rhetoric of the line. They're not trying to bolster it. But as far as I can tell, the effect of these images has been to cause people to post constantly on social media about their efforts to get in line, or if they're already in line, to improve their place in line. I'm focusing on this image because this happens a lot. This is how we in higher education tend to think about our fate. Everything tells us to believe that we are in a line. And so we rarely remember that actually we're in a herd. This issue is getting me in the heart. It's getting me in part because it's about me. I have an autoimmune disease, but I don't qualify for the vaccine except by my age. It's also about all the disabled people I know and don't know who also don't qualify as a group that would get the vaccine sooner. It's really getting me in the heart though because of my mom. My mom is 79. She's had lung cancer for nine years. She also struggles with certain technologies, especially those that involve new interfaces or that require fast moving decisions. I talked to her on Sunday, just a few days ago, and she was in tears. She had signed up to get an appointment. She's certainly eligible, but she didn't understand that when the response email hit her inbox at 8 a.m. on Sunday morning, she should immediately follow the link and start hammering away at the appointment system in order to break through. This is a process that some people say can take hours. As I talked to her and I heard the tears in her voice and I heard her say, I just feel stupid. I felt angry enough to smash something. Aside from my mom though, who is awesome, you should meet her. My point here is that this is not really about my mom. It's about the reason the process made her cry. Of course, vaccination is occurring in some order. It has to, that's a natural fact. My point rather is about the rhetoric of the line. No one set out to create this rhetoric, except maybe that guy who wrote the New York Times piece who I do have a significant beef with. The rhetoric of the line, in fact, is created by all of us, 
collectively. Our micro moves, the thousands of posts saying, I got my vaccine, I'm so privileged. The ways we understand our choices within the very limited frame that we've been presented with, that's the rhetoric of the line. This is a phenomenon that we must understand collectively. To do so otherwise is hurting people. In some cases, the harm is deadly. Remember again, that casual designation of prisoners at the end of the line, PS, not followed up about in the article. In some cases, it just makes people cry. When I visited Michigan State in 2019, I shared some findings from the study I'm working on now, which is a survey and interview study of disabled faculty members in higher education. This next slide offers a link to the study page and a small capture of the page. I'll spell out the link for those who aren't seeing the slide. It's Margaret Price, all one word, dot wordpress.com forward slash disabled hyphen faculty hyphen study. Now I've spent the last seven years analyzing the interview data and developing the key themes of this study. <laughs> After a lot more labor than I thought I was gonna put in, I have finally arrived at the following key themes, time, space, cost, and relationships. I won't be talking more about my analytical process today, but I'm happy to geek out about it in Q&A if anyone is interested. Rather, what I'm gonna focus on today is where those four key themes led me, which is to a strong conviction that the only way to achieve sustainable and equitable access in higher education is through shared accountability and collective care. I'm pausing to open my window. I always get very hot when I'm presenting. <coughs> now, as many of you have probably noticed, and as Jay talked about, what we thought of as access pre-pandemic was quite different from how we think about it now. Before the COVID pandemic, our events, classes, lectures, writing center sessions, meetings, these tended to be designed on the assumption that most of us would are able to interact face-to-face -face with ease. Therefore, requests by disabled people for aids to interaction, such as interpreters, accessible lighting, automatic door openers, were generally met with suspicion or concern. The concern, of course, was how much such measures would cost. Cost in these situations is typically framed as financial cost, and the amount of money required is deemed high or low based on an array of contextual factors, including not only existing budgets and precedent, but also humiliating metrics, such as whether the disabled person can demonstrate how badly they need the thing. The pandemic has turned those tables. Now, Zoom fatigue is a familiar phrase. It also seems the whole world suddenly understands that time can be both difficult and exhausting to account for. On the screen now is an image that you may have seen passed around in the last couple of months. It's a mock calendar page titled Gen Temporary 2020-01. With 42 days, but actually even more than 42, because when you look closely, you notice that it has a 13th day, another 13th day, then 13A, and 13B. It also has eight days in each week, including two Mondays, semi-Friday, and pizza night. I love this image, both because it's funny and also because it signals widespread recognition that under unbearable stress, time, labor, cognition, and sense itself may all begin to twist. Disabled academics have written a number of pieces pointing out that this so-called new normal is in fact the old normal for many of us. And yet, despite all the changes of the past year, fundamental patterns have tended to remain intact. For example, this is another story coming up. My university set aside funds about, what is it, February? About seven or eight months ago. There was a large fund available for internal grants, each up to $50,000 for projects that focus on COVID and racial justice. Unfortunately, these funds were offered for additional work and the grant money, like all grant money, 
is available only through a competitive process. So those who one might hope would benefit from such research, for example, people of color, disabled people, are being asked to do yet more work and compete harder in the name of redressing inequity. Furthermore, in this particular example, faculty applying for the grants were told that the funds could not be used toward release time. The funds could only be used for stuff like materials, um, research assistance, uh, things like that, software, not release time. The one thing you couldn't use these grants for was time. So this rule blatantly overlooked the fact that minoritized faculty, especially women of color, already do enormous amounts of extra work in mentoring, managing discrimination, and other forms of hidden labor. In other words, the likely applicants for these grants were probably the people who needed time more than anything else. I was part of a small team led by two women of color, and we started the process of applying for one of those grants. But partway through our work, we were informed of the no release time rule, and we abruptly stopped. We knew that any additional work, even if we had more assistance, would simply not fit into the timeframes of our existing lives. So we wrote to the office that administered the grants. Uh, we wrote to them in September, and we were told that they would look into it. In fact, they did. Two months later in November, they notified us that the rule had been changed, and we were welcome to apply for the new cycle of grants that would begin in January. However, after much discussion, our team ended up not applying, despite the change in policy. Two of us had small children at home, and another one of us had just lost a relative due to COVID. I offer this example to show two things. First, yet again, <laughs> we see why good intentions and the retrofit are simply not enough. But it also shows that at times, collective moves do make a difference. My would-be research team banded together to protest the discriminatory discriminatory setup of these grants. We received a response. The policy was changed. And although it was too late for us personally to benefit from the new policy, we did leave the place better than we found it. We were also even closer as colleagues and friends. Nevertheless, this is not a happy story. That was a lot of work. We did not receive any monetary compensation. Sometimes we felt like our time and effort had been wasted. But I am telling this story deliberately because it's part of the point I want to make today about collective accountability, about critical access. They are not pretty. So that's what I want to talk about for the rest of my time today. What does it mean what is it actually like to practice collective access and not just point to it as something that we hope to get to sometime? <coughs> Don't forget to move around a little if you want to and are able to. Just noticed I had my knees lacked, oops. Over the years that I've been working on the disabled faculty study, it's become obvious that when injustice is practiced in higher education, there are rarely individual villains to hold responsible. Maybe the occasional mean dean. The thing is most people in higher education want to do well by each other, want to practice equity and justice. We are the proverbial well-meaning people the well-meaning white people, the well-meaning middle-class people, the well-meaning straight people, the well-meaning non-disabled people. The problem is structure. The problem is discourse. The problem is what accountability really means. We want things to be better, but rarely are we willing to be actually accountable. Accountability moves will look different in every location. That's part of the point of collective access. There's no set recipe or checklist for achieving it. But at the same time, we can think through the stories we have of times when care and access do work in some way, however messy. We can think about what was happening to make such practices possible. 
and we th can think about finding ways to hold space for them to help make them more likely going forward. So I wanna offer just one more story from my own classroom about what the messy process of collective access and shared accountability might actually look like. And I also wanna emphasize that this is from my point of view as the instructor of the classes. One of the most important access questions we can ask is who it's not working for and not only who it's not working for, but especially why that person might be hard to find. <laughs> As a side note, I would like to offer a dramatization of the wrong way to check on access. Um, stand at the front of a room, refuse the microphone that's offered to you and say, can everybody hear me? And then quickly move on. <laughs> that, that is not how you find the people who are experiencing a lack of access. Anyway, here's the story I have so far. All the classes I've taught since March, 2020 have been fully online, a mix of synchronous and asynchronous elements. Before that, the last time I taught fully online, and I want you to really, really take this in. The last time I taught fully online was in 2002. And that was a year when MySpace was in the future. <laughs> so as you can imagine, I thought a lot about various elements of my classes. I thought about how to make the course sites as accessible as possible. I thought about how to arrange assignments and deadlines. I thought about how to run both asynchronous and synchronous discussions. <clears throat> the one big decision that I made for all my classes across the board was that we would simply slow down together. I built in time, actually a huge amount of time, to do things like the following. First, incorporated time to include people who are contributing entirely via the chat option on Zoom. I incorporated days with no new assignments except reflecting and writing on what we'd already done. I built in time to negotiate changing access needs. For example, some students' videos might not work predictably, whereas other students might be relying on those videos to pick up words and cues through speech reading. I, bu I built in time to back up and repeat discussions or readings if they simply didn't go well the first time. <laughs> uh, deviating from the slide for a moment, one of the most common reasons why something might not go well the first time was that we would just all show up tired. <laughs> We would show tired and be like, you know, let's just wrap it up for today. <laughs> I built in time for at least one 10 minute break per hour. And that was during uh, any synchronous meetings my classes were having. I also de-emphasized discussions of readings. I highlighted activities like bring something to class. We will think about it and talk about it together. My students promptly renamed this activity <laughs> independently in two different classes, show and tell. Now, most people here probably recognize that these practices are already common in the writing classroom. This is not like revolutionary new pedagogy that I'm presenting. Um, this is just good practice for process pedagogy, critical pedagogy. Also, I should note that I did not carry out these ideas by thinking of them ahead of time, nor did I implement them with special grace. I thought of them one by one, sometimes somewhat randomly, Sometimes they were suggested by students and I implemented them as was possible. I also made lots of mistakes. For example, I was, <laughs> I was on a real mania for feedback uh, that first semester um, and last semester too. I was doing pre-semester surveys and regular check-ins during class and longer check-ins and shorter check-ins. Um, and, and in my excitement about, about checking in with students as much as I possibly could, um, I kind of forgot that I would also need to build in time to read and act on all this feedback. <laughs> so now I, I do that a little bit more mindfully. Collective access, which is what I was trying to practice in my classes, is always happening in the now. It's always being prototyped. It's always evolving. And this is the note I would offer to teachers, consultants, and students of writing. Those of us who have decades of experience and those of us who are maybe more new to the work. Even though our discipline is one of the best when it comes to accessible and flexible teaching, 
we still need opportunities to pause and think about how we are doing what we're doing. For example, number one on the list. Some days, some of my students couldn't speak aloud. This might be because their audio wasn't working. They might have their audio turned off for various reasons. Um, or it might be just some other reason that they were not vocalizing. It would have been easy to just let the chat flow by right next to the um, oral and aural discussion that we were having on Zoom and just pretend that everything was like so multimodal. You know, we have the oral discussion and we have the chat over there and everything is just like bing, bang, boom, woo, layers. <laughs> Sometimes I do run class like that. I, I kind of try to figure out how people are doing and, um, and see if we might need to slow down the oral discussion or slow down the chat. It's, it's very much kind of a, a gut call on my part. The thing is, I knew from experience that a fast flowing torrent of words, if they're both oral and written at the same time, that will almost inevitably leave some people out. And even if it left no one out, why not take a moment to linger? Why not offer some redundancy, a sense of return in the classroom? So at times while teaching, I will pause and start vocalizing comments that are coming through on the chat, or more commonly, I will ask others to help me vocalize them. Now, again, this is the instructor's perspective and I don't really have any special findings for my students on how this is all working. Maybe these moments of slowness and reflection are not adding anything to the classroom. Maybe they are. I've been studying academic institutions for a long time. I am honestly not sure what sorts of changes are possible or at what scale or when. I am firmly convinced that collective accountability, that a shared sense of care and responsibility toward each other is the only thing that will move us closer to the equitable, the just environment that we say we want. I just don't know exactly how we might do that. I don't even know if it's feasible in certain kinds of spaces. There's one thing I know for sure though. We must begin moving in ways that assume we are all vulnerable and assume we are all accountable to each other. Accountable in immediate ways. Accountable in life and death ways. If we didn't learn that from the past year, we have learned nothing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Price. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, we, we have time today to address some questions if folks in the audience would like to share their thoughts, their questions, things they'd like to hear from you about. And I know before the event began, we actually had a few folks submit questions ahead of time. So maybe I could start with one or two of those while folks who are present in the Zoom room today mull their thoughts over. So one of the questions that was first submitted um, is this. How can we center disabled faculty when they're underemployed and when access services are often dominated by abled staff? I'm watching the uh, captioning. I can put the text to that question. Oh, that. that would be awesome. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Uh, thank you. I think one key to this question is who the we are. Um, if it's we, everybody in higher education, I think um, right now the, the uh, landscape is pretty bleak. <laughs> um, when I present specific uh, stories from my research, the disabled faculty study. Um, when I talk about the, the things that have happened to different faculty, uh, both teaching faculty and uh, other, other, faculty, other people in other um, roles in, the, in their institutions, um, some of the stories I've heard are, are absolutely abhorrent. Um, so, Part of what I am trying to think about when I'm trying to think, what would it mean to actually bring true access, equitable access to um, different, different schools, different parts of schools 
is it has everything to do with the specific context of the situation. It has to do with those four factors that I've identified through my research, time, space, cost, and relationships. Um, and it has to do with not just being lucky enough to land into land in a place where where those factors are working in your favor, but being aware of those factors and thinking about um, max uh, optimizing them in a sense. So I'll I'll offer one one example. Uh, let's think about um, the fact that disabled faculty are underemployed, access services are dominated by abled staff. These things are both very true. Uh, Let's imagine that um, I'm arriving at Ohio State five years ago, which happened. Um, I'm disabled and I need to start thinking through access. One of the things that helped me most was being able to find the person at my school who was actually in charge of providing access. Um, in my case, that's my school's uh, ADA coordinator, Americans with Disabilities Act coordinator. Um, that's the person who's responsible at Ohio State for handling faculty accommodations. Um, now, according to the interview, sorry, the survey and the interviews that we did on the disabled faculty study, that is often the first and biggest barrier for disabled employees at schools is they either can't find where they're supposed to go or quite often um, there is no official place for them to go to uh, get someone to work with them on their own accommodations or their access needs. Uh, in some cases, they're advised to go to their own direct report. For example, oh, you need access. You should talk to your chair about that. Obviously problematic. Uh, in some cases, employees are dealing directly with human resources, um, an office that is by definition invested in um, maximizing employee labor and minimizing costs. So that also creates some conflictual situations. And uh, in some cases uh, for disabled faculty, it means just trying to figure it out for themselves, deciding that that disclosure is not worth it for them, not possible, they're not gonna do it. Um, so centering those concerns, going back to who the we is, uh, let's imagine that this is, the we is a department chair, like Margaret, Margaret just arrived at OSU, her department chair can make it transparent to everyone arriving at the university this is where you go to find out about access. Um, not just sort of pick out who the individual disabled people are and say, oh, I'm gonna give you all the access information. Just make sure everybody has that information. Um, and speaking of support services being dominated by abled staff, this gets to the dimension of relationships, that may or may not be a horrific barrier. Um, I worked in disability support services at my um, uh, graduate institution, University of Massachusetts. And the longer I kind of struggle my way along in higher education, the more I feel like the issue is simply whether someone has a grip on how access works regard, uh, and not whether they themselves are, are identify as disabled or not. I also wonder um, when we're thinking about the issue of underemployment of disabled people, uh, that's sort of outside the purview of my research um, because I study the situation for people who have usually through strenuous effort found their way into academic jobs. But it is worth looking at the ways that underemployment of disability of disabled people is framed. Um, I'm actually writing a chapter on, uh, on accountability and cost right now. And it's so interesting to find that almost all the research on the underemployment of disabled people focuses on um, what one study called striving to be employed. The situation is actually a lot more complicated but, than that. Not only because uh, one's social services may depend upon remaining unemployed, uh, which is a really gross catch 22 that's been written about extensively, but also because it might be worth thinking about pushing back against the notion of disabled people as another form of human capital. Um, now, on a, in a practical sense, being employed is very important for a lot of reasons, uh, financial, psychological, the, the research on this is enormous. 
But I think it's also valuable with such a question to say, when we are talking about work, what is it that we actually are meaning? What assumptions are we making about what work is and about the necessary nature of work for citizenship? Again, I don't want to underplay the fact that, especially in the U.S. and especially for disabled people, some form of remuneration is, is survival, um, whether you achieve that through your employment or through your social services or whatever other issue. But I think it's important to uncouple the notion of work as something that's important from the notion of something from work as something that is necessary for human value. Uh, because those are those are really different questions. Uh, let's see. Um, so that's that's that one. Uh, Karen, I guess I'm going back to you. Yes, that's actually a really great segue into one of our other questions um, where someone says, I, and I can put this in the chat as well. Thank you. I'm, I'm very interested in the approach to slow down and rethink the way we live work and study. From a perspective of access, what are your thoughts on or solutions for moving away from the value in academia and elsewhere that our worth is measured by our productivity? Yes, this is, this is also a, a really important question to think about. And in my, um, in my emphasis on thinking about slowing down collectively, um, it's really important to say, I understand that that's just often not possible. There are so many reasons why slowing down is not possible. Um, some of us are required to display a certain amount of quote unquote productivity within certain time frames, or we will lose our jobs. Um, there are also sometimes less tangible penalties to not going as fast as possible. Um, and <laughs> Of course, the, the direction that neoliberal higher education is going in is, is so breakneck toward going faster and faster that nobody even hesitates anymore to say, well, we're asking you to do more with less. <laughs> I was part of a faculty team a couple of years ago where we were just, tr basically we were trying to get something done. Uh, and um, an upper administrator at our university said to us, as if this were a tremendous favor, we are asking you to do more with less. And I was like, that's not positive. Like, don't say that as if it's a treat. No. So, so these things are, are incredibly urgent and really difficult. So I just, I wanna emphasize that I am not one of those people being like, just slow down, man, it's great. Like that, that's a really privileged point of view. What I am advocating for and hoping for, going back to the notion of collective moves, sometimes happening on small scales, is to look at the times and places you're in a particular situation and say, is this a situation where we could slow down together? It might be a writing consultant and a student um, who together say, actually the goal we're gonna set for this particular session is just to look at this one sentence or just to look at this one four sentences. Actually writing consultants do that all the time. That in itself, even though there are probably only two people involved, is a collective decision to slow down. You can slow down with a class. You can also slow down a meeting. It's a lot easier to slow down a meeting if you're the convener of the meeting. Uh, but that's another interesting moment to think through. Do we need to be going at the pace that we are? Is there a way that we could think about time, not just as moving slower, but perhaps just as moving differently? Uh, this is all pretty fresh in my mind because I, um, I just finished the chapter of the book that's about time. <laughs> um, it, it has a massive bone to pick with the, the so-called slow movement, um, but it also talks about different aspects of time in academe that are unusual, uh, some that are, can be quite harmful, and then some that we can think about as collective ways to almost literally pull together. Uh, that article is coming out in the South Atlantic Quarterly, by the way. Oh, Karen, I'm about to send something awkwardly to the panelists. Would you mind sending that on? Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, this is part of a, um, a series of articles that is being um, edited by 
uh, Ellen Samuels, S-A-M-U-E-L-S, and uh, Elizabeth Freeman, F-R-E-E-M-A-N. It's a whole essay on crip temporalities. And in addition to saying, it's not enough to just glibly say, slow down. And we also can think about slowness and differences in pace and stamina in ways that are really fruitful for groups trying to work collectively together. I also want to deeply emphasize that collectivity, especially when you try to adjust pace as a group, can truly be awkward. Um, it's awkward sometimes when you're trying to get to a restaurant together as a group in those bygone days when we used to go to restaurants in groups. It can be awkward when you're pausing and realizing that you didn't provide a slide with necessary spellings and you just stop and spell everything out. It can be awkward when some members of the class wish we could zoom faster through material, but the whole class is moving at a more deliberate pace for reasons. Alison Kafer, K-A-F-E-R, has written in her wonderful book, Feminist Queer Crip, that crip time doesn't simply mean going slower. It doesn't simply mean offering extended time. It means exploding what we think of as normative time frames, what we think of as our ordinary temporal limits. And I know I'm a real broken record on this, but there, there actually is no template. Um, what I want to do instead, as I try to think about, well, how would we actually do accountability? What would that look like? One of the first things I want to encourage people to do is look around the situations you are in today, this week, this month, and ask, what would this group look like as a collective? What would happen? What would we be doing the same? What would we be doing differently? What would happen if our fundamental assumption was that we were accountable first and foremost to each other? Awesome. I, are you ready for your next one? I'm ready. Okay. So I'm gonna pop this in the chat as well. I think that's a good way for folks to see the language. This person writes, I'm fascinated by the concept of critical access and trying to enact it in my work in various ways. I'm thinking through what to do when I'm attending a workshop or professional development session on universal design that is deliberately oriented to fitting students into existing systems. I even attended one session where a presenter said, universal design is not about disability. What are your thoughts on how to interrupt this? if possible? Another really important question. Uh, one, what I'm thinking about how to, first of all, I'm, I'm a very direct person and I can sometimes be a little rude in my interruptions. So I'm usually trying to tone myself down a little. Uh, but one of my first questions in situations like this is what are the stakes? Who's learning bad shit? Where's the bad stuff gonna go? What will be the cost to me of intervening? Is there some way that intervening could be a shared effort? Often not. Often you're just by yourself there at a workshop or a webinar and you don't even know who else is there and stuff like that. So one of my first questions is, is almost always, what is the cost to me? Um, and then another question is, uh, what will change if my, my attempted intervention is successful? Uh, so again, sort of thinking about this through the lens of cost, not monetary cost, but other kinds of costs like cost to my body mind. Um, those are really important considerations to me, whether to even get into it or not. If I were trying to speak to something like this, uh, something where I just thought people were sort of spreading information where I was like, ah, not like that. Um, I would probably try to do it, uh, through the form of questions. Um, sometimes I think I can be annoyingly disingenuous with this kind of question, like, have you considered? Sometimes that makes a useful difference, I think, and sometimes not. Uh, for the rhetoric folks here, it's always about rhetoric. Who's the audience? How are they being addressed? What is it that they are taking up from what you say? And especially how large is the context where change is occurring? Um, one example is that 
I went to a conference about five years ago, which is not at all in my home discipline. It was a, a design conference called Living Future. And um, this conference really made me mad. It had a lot of what I call white guys on bikes. White guys on bikes are design professionals who think they're being super sustainable and accessible, but they're actually, in my opinion, not. Um, and uh, my spouse is an architect, so I'm sort of adjacent to this community a lot. And uh, Z and I, here pronoun is spelled Z-E, um, were, were just thinking, how might we change this environment in some small way? This is a community that my spouse is very invested in. Um, I'm less invested in, but you know the access piece felt really important. So we decided to go to various panels and just ask questions. And, and we did try to do it in good faith. You know, For example, were there disabled people as part of this design process? Or when you talk about affordable housing, um, what factors went into considering the concept of affordable? An interesting thing that I've learned by trying to raise these questions in different environments is often the person that I'm addressing has actually thought about my concerns very carefully. Um, sometimes not, sort of sounds like this particular universal design workshop was not awesome. <laughs> but sometimes, interestingly, the person will unleash a lot of knowledge about my concern. Uh, this happens to me with uh, rehabilitation specialists all the time. I think in disability studies, we tend to think of the entire discipline of rehabilitation and rehab psychology as just being opposite to what we do. My personal experience with rehab psychologists is that they have agonized over some of the most important questions in disability studies. Their work just doesn't reflect it the way that we think it should reflect it. And that's sort of a, a issue, a side issue that we can talk about more. Um, but anyway, so my spouse and I decided to go around and ask questions at these panels. And a few years later, we went back to the same conference and it's a very, very small conference. It was mostly the same people. So it wasn't really hard to track the progress of this conversation. People were asking better questions. Um, for example, someone asked me an extremely difficult question, which was, I have learned that it's very important to include disabled people in my design charrettes. That is my, my meetings where I'm talking about how something might be designed. And then he said, with complete honesty, where do I find them? Wow. I was like, well, that's a different question. Um, it's, it's got its own problems. I, I don't really want us to think in terms of like discovering disabled people who we can shoehorn into our charrettes. There's actually a word for that. It's called participation washing, um, all one word. But that is an interesting and a new question that you have arrived at. Uh, there actually is something called the disabled list that, um, has disabled people uh, specific, who are specifically volunteering to be that guinea pig and say, I will talk to you about my disabled perspective. Um, again, kind of a side issue to, to the person's question. Uh, the point I wanna make is not, a, it, it is always a specific situation. You always have to weigh the rhetorical factors involved. And I would caution, you always have to think about whether it's worth it to you. Um, but I do think that if we, if we temper our expectations for what change looks like, we do perceive those incremental changes happening in the spaces that we care about. Cool. We have time for about one more question, but very conveniently for the sake of our question askers, our last three questions actually make a lot of sense together. So I'm going to hybridize them and putting them in the chat in their entirety, and then I'll read them. So the first question is, I completely agree that retrofitting accessibility isn't ideal and can make disabled people feel othered. I've been there myself. But what do we do about the existing inaccessible systems while we work on overhauling things? The second question, are there opportunities within the concepts of collective care and shared accountability that enable us to work toward equitable access without having to depend on the higher ups and those who run structures to create change? And then lastly, what is the role of an official accessibility statement in the idea of collective accountability? 
Yes, these are great. Also, just wonderful questions. Um, since we're at time, I'm going to answer relatively quickly. Uh, <clears throat> first, fine. in terms of, sorry, I, you're fine. Take as long as okay. you like. <laughs> uh, in terms of working within existing accessible systems, and I say this absolutely shamelessly, exploit the existing system as much as possible. Um, I am not in the least pure when it comes to attempting to achieve access strategically. For one thing, I receive accommodations. I, I don't believe in them uh, as a long-term strategy, but hell yes, I use them. I advocate for them for my students. Um, they're one of the most robust ways we have right now of attempting to achieve justice in specific moments in the US university. So that's one of the structures I work within. Um, I also will figure out ways to work or hack the system to achieve accessibility and especially pay for accessibility as much as I can. I will think about ways to redistribute resources. Um, Amy Hamry, A-I-M-I-H-A-M-R-A-I-E, has wonderful writing on thinking through ways to hack academic resources to redistribute them more widely. Um, so I just want to be really clear that, um, I am, a, a an absolute fan of practicing what S. Bear Bergman, B-E-A-R-B-E-R-G-M-A-N has called, um, well, he was calling it at the time strategic lesbianism. Uh, and, and what he meant in that point, which he made a long time ago was basically if, if you are going to get your needs met by str being strategically reductive or, or, temporarily buying into a system that you are not a part of and don't believe in, go ahead and do it. This is about redistribution of resources. It's not about being a perfect person all the time. Uh, the question of depending on higher ups is really hard. I think this is one of the big sticking points for me when I try to think about collective access occurring, not just in smaller spaces, but at scale. I will just honestly answer, I do not know whether or not we need to blow up the existing system. <laughs> I'm really trying to figure it out. Uh, I, I'm kind of a, um, a, a passionate reformer at heart. I'm, I'm not a very good revolutionary. Uh, and so I am in there fighting all the time, um, uh, trying to think about ways to improve the system as it is, in part because when we burn down systems, a lot of people get hurt, uh, but a lot of people are being hurt now. And, um, you know, maybe by the time I'm 60, I'll be like, burn it all down. Uh, it's, it's a tough call and it's actually one I'm trying to figure out right now. Uh, I just wanna point out that Johanna Schmertz, a uh, uh, female rhetorician um, came up with strategic essentialism uh, about 30 years ago. Um, and the last question about accessibility statements, I'm wondering if the person who asked this question is referring to collective accountability, uh, collective accessibility statements, or maybe, uh, would like to be pointed to the resource. I'm going to take a guess and say in the journal Kairos, I think about four years ago, a piece was published about rewriting syllabus accessibility statements so that they are more collective and less aimed at individual people volunteering to be targeted for accommodations. Um, so uh, that is um, a resource I definitely encourage everyone to look up. I'm just gonna take one moment of quiet to try to remember the authors. Yes, uh, Tara Wood, W-O-O-D is one of the authors. And uh, the other is Shannon Madden, M-A-D-D-E-N. Uh, and that question is really in the spirit of what I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about change in many places at once. It's not only how we interact with each other face to face, it's about our documents, policies, the language we use. These are all ways that we can act collectively and continue to rethink what collective action really means. Awesome. Margaret, thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us today and for sharing your knowledge, for sharing this great conversation, for answering our questions, and for being part of the speaker series. We are so grateful to have had you with us today. And I don't know, 
Thanks. Thank you all. I'm so honored to have been here. I'm going to sign off with some uh, deaf applause, which is uh, waving my hands near my ears. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. We hope we'll see you at future installments of the series. And in the meantime, enjoy your afternoons. Thanks again.